The second leg of our journey will take us through the Tuscan countryside from Florence to Siena, home of the world's oldest and possibly most troubled bank, Banca Monte di Paschi. So Siena, where we're about to arrive when this traffic lets up, hopefully. Not a hugely important city, though a very beautiful one. But in medieval Italy, one of the great trading centers and Florence's great rival for hundreds of years as a destination for you know, merchant. Merchants and business and, and political influence. So they fought each other for centuries, two and a half centuries at least, on and off in this very medieval way, which was, you don't actually do any of the fighting yourself. No. You hire a mercenary, mercenary army yeah. uh, made up of the scum of Europe, English, <laughs> Germans, <laughs> Swiss, <laughs> Belgians, um, to do the fighting for you. Uh, and these are really quite small armies. But uh, Siena didn't actually formally come under the control of Florence until the 16th century when it was actually controlled by the Habsburg Spanish. And uh, they owed a great deal of money to the Medici banking house. I didn't everybody. So the Medici uh, acquired Siena in a debt for equity swap. <laughs> <laughs> Two and a half centuries of fighting, but they're actually acquired but in a debt for a, in a financial transaction. And Florence having bought it, essentially, in a debt for equity swap, um, then uh, controlled the growth and development of uh, Siena in the traditional way by imposing punitive taxes on the place so that Florence was a much better place to do business than Siena. Yeah, and so Siena never grew, um, which, you know, has turned out to be a great blessing for it. I think everything's still intact. Why is everything intact? Because <laughs> yeah, no growth. However, despite, yes, being, exactly. despite being only um, 55,000 people these days, uh, they still um, have to have their own divisions, which they do. Um, and uh, you will find an interesting story about the subdivisions of Siena, which I'll tell you when we arrive. Beautiful, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Here's a place with a population of, when they built this, 80, 100,000. Look at this. I mean, that's a small town almost anywhere else in the world. Yeah. But they thought they needed this. The scale of the ambition is amazing. So we're in Florence, and now we're in Siena. Only a few miles apart, mortal enemies. To this day, people in Siena still don't like Florentines. But when Sienese get together, they're not united. They're part of these 17 contrada. 17 contrada. So the population of Siena these days is like 55,000 people. Is that all? 55,000? Yeah. I mean, Florence ensured that this place would never flourish by having differential tax rates, which is interesting, right? Because you can fight someone for two and a half centuries, but if you really want to restrict it, who imposed taxes on yeah. it. So drove all the business to Florence. Florence flourished, Siena stopped developing. But when they're together, they're not united as Sienese unless they're fighting someone else. When they're together, they're, they're, they're down to 17 different districts or the Contrada, and that's who race in the Palia. Well, nine of the 17 qualify to race here. And once again, this isn't an affectation. These Contrada, they really dislike each other. Right. So that, well, hang on, do the math, there's what, 3,000 odd people in each Contrada. I mean, yeah. it's, and I'm sure when the Contrada get together, they probably don't like each other either. It's probably family disputes or something, but yeah. anyway. Giuseppe, yeah. we're, he's, we're not talking to him. It's a perfect and beautiful representation of this Italian genius for division and internal fighting. So the Contrada get together to fight the Florentines. And then I suppose at some level, the Tuscans get together to fight you know, the, the Neapolitans the or the Milanese. And then rarely, rarely do the Italians get together <laughs> to fight someone else. Well, I mean, almost never, because of course, it wasn't a country that was reunited until, the, you know, 1870. Well, you see, this, this is, you know, I remember when I first read that and I, I had to go back and 
read it again. So I'm thinking, you know, Italy's been a country for less time than the United States. A- about as half we the time. Understand about it. half the time. Half the time. And yet there's so much history here. And so, you know, it's such a contradiction. We're in a place that feels like it's just stopped in time. Yes. Yeah, you know, that, that it just, I mean, it, you look around it, it's remarkable. You, you take away the, the awnings and the, and the plate glass in the front of the stores. I mean, we're, 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 we're centuries past. Think about the wealth of this place, though. Population, let's say, 100,000 in the 14th century. They built this. I mean, yeah. look at it. Yeah, yeah. It, the, the ambition, the wealth, the scale of the uh, audacity. Most towns of 50 to 100,000 people do not need a, t- a square this big or a, or a, or a, a municipal uh, premises this big. But so you go from a situation of enormous confidence, uh, optimism, wealth, to a place that really doesn't grow for 600 years. Right. Uh, but that, but you know, when we talk about growth, which is a big part of the debate about Europe and Italy, uh, you know, this idea that the Italian economy is smaller still than it was in 08, whereas other economies have grown, we think of this in a, in, a, in a small way, but we're sitting in the middle of somewhere that hasn't really grown for centuries. So, so that is, that's a possibility. It can happen. But radical ecologists would say, this is a great example of what happens when you stop growing yeah. and you preserve things and um, they remain pristine and beautiful. But, th- but this, you know, we, we get this idea of growth on a world scale where mm. we've seen there was always a, either a country, a significant country or a region that was growing at a decent clip. Six, seven, eight, ten, twelve percent in Italy or China. And the fact that you've had that one significant well, the, the reason world, we, you and I were in Asia was because that was where the growth was, was right. I mean, you had half the world's people, and it was growing rapidly. First of all, Southeast right. Asia, then North Asia, then China. Series of huge boosts to global growth from hundreds of millions of people entering the global workforce, becoming consumers, and sucking in resources and sucking in labour. We don't seem to have that now. You know, we, we've China at six and a half now. They India, say. They say. They I say. I think it's probably. Yeah, more like four and a half. Even so, but w- without that engine of growth, are we entering a world where two to three percent is good? Which it feels to me we are, certainly in the West. And if so, what does that mean? What does that lower for longer mean? Because here, it means nothing. It means life goes on, and it means this place is a moment in time that people from all over the world want to come see, including the massive group behind us that's just, just, just emptied out of a coach somewhere. But, 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 but what happens? Does, does, is that where the world is going to be now? There's no problem with growing at 3% a year, right? I mean, if you grow at 3% a year, it means your economy double, doubles every generation. Right. That's not bad. No, it's not. On, historical, on long-term historical uh, perspective, that's pretty good as long as you don't have a massive war or a famine or a disease that or wipes you out. unsupportable debt. Ah, yes. Well, that's another matter, right? I mean, the only way that that, that 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 sort of growth becomes problematic is for two reasons. One, if you're already very poor, yep. that's going to be bad, right? So if you're stuck in a poverty trap and you're growing slowly, then that's going to cause a real level of descent. The other thing is if you enter a period of low growth, and this Italy is a great example of this, with too much debt, because the only way you really ever truly dissolve debt is inflation or growth. Correct. Neither of which we have. Right. So, so what does that mean? So if you enter a period of, of, of time where your, your demography is not constructive, Italian demography is not constructive, clearly immigration is highly problematic. What does that mean? It means that Italy, has to, Italy and Japan obviously have the worst, some of the worst demographics in the world, and they both have huge levels of sovereign debt. Right? In Japan, it's now over, what, 200 and... 240, I think it is. 240. Italy but is here what, it's 130 130, yeah. I mean, so you've got an economy that's still stuck around $2 trillion. Um, sovereign debt's around 2.4. Um, and growth is, well, nil for uh, a decade. Yeah, right. And that's, and that's problematic. And that, that's the problem. Exactly. That's the problem. Servicing and eventually, maybe even possibly, paying down the debt. Ha! It's not likely to happen anytime soon. Um, becomes increasingly problematic. That debt is what traps Italy inside this box with the EU. Yeah. Because 
Italy needs to be a member of the European Union in order to have low rates, in order to service its unserviceably high debt. Right? That's why Quitterly is not going to happen. They can't afford to, because rates would double. That would mean effectively the entire Italian budget would go to service in the debt. But if, but if, they, if, if they do that and they go back to the lira, is there a possibility of a reset of some sort? I mean, obviously, it's going to ripple. It's, there's going to be... This is not, not something with, not, that Italy hasn't been through before. Not without a default. Right. Not, not without no, a default. Exactly right. But that's happened before. I, I sure. mean, for it to happen to a G7 country would be astonishing. But is that a way out for Italy? It's a way out, but it's, it's a bit like dropping the H-bomb, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. But, but, but if, if you're prepared... If we, if we are getting down to the negotiation stage of this, if you're prepared to put that on the table, which, let's face it, the Greeks were. The Greeks put that on the table, um, fudged it, obviously. Uh, we don't know what kind of backroom deals were made with the Greeks or backroom pressure put on them, because there was no, didn't seem to be any deal made, but they got the bailout they needed. If you're prepared, which the League and Five Star claim to be, to go to any lengths to stick it to the Europeans, could we see that as some kind of standoff, do you think? I think the fact that, you know, as you mentioned, Italy is a G7 country. Maybe it's someone in Congress it is. The pride that Italy has in itself is on a different level to the Greeks, I think. I mean, yes. it, it, there are certain similarities, but there are some very important differences. I mean, this place is a testament to the pride Italians feel sure. in, in, their, in themselves and their achievements. So I think it's, it's, it's unlikely to end up there, but in a sufficiently antagonistic situation, given the domestic situation in Italy and the increasing frustration of Italians with Brussels, I don't think it's impossible. So if they want to have more stimulus, more fiscal stimulus, the only way is in some way to break out. If they break out, I think monetary rates go higher. So that's the trap. Well, and, and this, you know, th this is why sitting here is so opposite to talking about this, because at that point, they necessarily, I guess, all become Italians again. And, and it, Italy becomes one contrada inside Europe. And the Grillos and the Northern Leagues of the world are fighting for their contrada in amongst this, this, this wider scope. And if, it, if, if you galvanize Italians into that kind of frame of mind, who knows what you can achieve? Yes, possibly. I mean, clearly that's, 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 that's a possibility. It, it strikes me as pretty unlikely. I mean, one of the other Achilles heels that Italy has is not just its sovereign debt, it's this banking crisis, which is one of the reasons we should come here yeah. to Siena, because the banks are in a very poor state and have remained in a poor state. They've never really recovered since 2007. Um, they've been in a state of either denial or denying how bad the problem is, but against total borrowings of 2.2 trillion, about one times GDP, approximately 11, 12% of that is non-performing. Well, I mean, the, the, as you said, the beauty of being here in Siena is just up that hill is one of the oldest banks in the world. I think it's the world's oldest continuously operating right. bank, established in 1472. So it, feel, it, feel, it feels rude for us to talk about Italian banks without going to go and take a look at Monte de Pesky. So maybe we'll just get the, get the check, finish our coffees and go and take a look up there. What do you reckon? Good. All right. The fate of Italy's banking system, for better or worse, seems inexorably tied to its place at the heart of the European Union. The fragility of Italy's banks mirrors that of the country as a whole, and their reliance upon state aid and low interest rates have placed them in an increasingly perilous situation. Here we are at Monte Paschi. Monte de Paschi, world's oldest continuously operating bank. And pretty nice building. Beautiful. Here's a guy who's just seen the balance sheet of the current Monte Paschi. As you can see, he's not <laughs> looking very happy about this. For <laughs> just reason. So, formed in 1472, Monte de Paschi, Mound of Piety. So it was formed as a charitable uh, organization whose profits all went to charity in the local area. And that's carried on, even to this day. 1472, continuously operating. Yeah, so six, almost six centuries. Almost six centuries. 400 and, no, 572 years 
as a private enterprise, continuously operated. It went public in 1999. Since then, in the last 18 years, it's had three government bailouts. It's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, it's truly extraordinary. And it speaks volumes about what we spoke about, incentives, responsibilities, right here. I mean, it's writ large. After they IPO'd in 1999, they trebled the balance sheet. Yep. Trebled the balance sheet in seven years. Stock hit an all-time high of, in current money, because it's been recapitalized several yeah. times now, 9,300 euros in the summer of, of 07. Perfect, of Current course. price, around 1.6. So you really want to meet the guy who paid 9,300 right. and find out what his strategy is for, get, for breaking even. Well, yeah, you, you, every stand, obviously. You obviously. buy one at one, you're in at four and a half grand and things are looking better. It may, it may, be, it may be a lesson to uh, people on average and down. No. So what happened here? They trebled the balance sheet. And then when 08 came and everything got really bad really quickly, ultimately 45% of their entire debt base was considered to be non-performing. 45%? I mean, how do you find that many bad credits? And a third of it, a third of it is still essentially non-performing. So a right. third of that 150 billion that they created, or 100 billion they created anew. When you actually look into what happened, I mean, this is obviously the worst, but Unicredito was 207 euros in the summer of 07. Yeah. 11 right now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it wasn't that Monty Pasky was unusual, right? Keynes's famous rule, right? If you're a banker, the one thing you must never do is fail idiosyncratically, right? right. Always fail together. And they all did the same thing. It's just these guys did it more and more aggressively and from a smaller capital base, and they were trying to catch up. But that mindset, that mindset change from a, from a 500 year old institution, how does that happen so fast? Because you guys come in, okay, we've got a great idea because we need to grow. How about we list, it'll be great, we get access to more capital. I mean, and we'll be able to create an incentive to attract real talent. Right. Because then we'll have a currency. So then we'll be able to offer incentives. Yeah. We'll be able to offer bonuses. And what did the bank want to do? It wanted to expand its balance sheet. So what were the managers being incentivized to do? Expand the balance sheet, yeah. not make a profit, no. not, make a, not, make a, not make a solid, long-term financial organization, expand the balance sheet. That's what we're going to incentivize you to do. And you've got to say, they did it, 300% increase. Well, they did. But in everyone, seven years, everyone, that's pretty good. Everybody watching it uses that as their metric to value it. You know, the, the whole thing's so circuitous that we're going to expand the balance sheet, we're going to lend more money. And the people watching it go, they're lending more money, this is great for the business, the business is growing. It's, it's I mean, it's Why it's would you ludicrous. ever value a business on revenues? Right. Why would you ever value a business on revenues? I can sell you a dollar at 99 cents all day. Yeah. My revenues are going to look spectacular. Sure. It just never, I have no idea why would anyone want a business with lots of revenues. But this what is you actually want is a business that makes a profit. Now, banking does make a profit. Look at this. This is they yeah. built. They built yeah. this with profits. Yeah. From a bench over there. From a bench. To this. It's a profitable business if you do it right. Um, but if you do it badly, you can run out of money extremely quickly. Well, and, and go out of business, but that's the whole point, right? It's a really simple business to grow steadily. If you want to start growing exponentially, the only way to do it is to take unnecessary risks, right? That's, that's the way. So why is the Italian banking situation so much worse than most other places? It wasn't that they did anything extraordinary. Montepaschi had a specific derivatives sure. catastrophe, and the lending was reckless. But all the other banks are somewhat similar. I mean, they're, they're obviously right. better well, on banks. And all the other countries. This is, this is a common or garden banking problem. It's 68% owned by the government, by the way, now. Right? Yeah. So the IPO has been two-thirds reversed anyway. Right? Sure. I mean, it used to be owned by a mound of piety. Now it's 68% <laughs> yes. right. owned by, by the Italian taxpayer, who's really underwater as well. So what went wrong here is just another chapter in the story, which is this, this is what banks do when credit conditions are eased and they're under an incentive to expand their balance sheet. Yeah. It's not really fundamentally different to what happened in America. No. But there is one major difference, which is that since 2008, the American economy has expanded. It's now significantly bigger yeah. than it was in 2008. That means even those bad debts, eventually they get dissolved, right? I mean, eventually economic growth solves all your problems. You haven't had economic growth in Italy for 10 years. You've got 
55 million people, most of them employed, most of them doing a good job, and you've seen zero economic yeah. growth. And that's what makes the Italian problem so serious, because without growth, you can't grow your way out of your problems. And you're stuck. You're not lending. Well, we know they're not lending yep. because we had this huge credit problem in Italy in 2013, 2014, where no one could get credit. We haven't been able to get credit on, on anything we've tried to do here. So credit's effectively dried up. So what are you, what's your plan? Your problem is to, plan is to work out of your way out of your bad debts? Well, guess what? For that, you need rising asset prices. For that, you need Correct. economic growth. So it's a huge problem, and it's not getting any better. In fact, you can see the fact that the share prices have all collapsed. I mean, there was a reasonable bounce in them. Monte Pasqui got back to, like, 1,100 in the yeah. summer of 2014. One last chance to lose all your money if you're a, if you're a trader. You're only down 90% at that yeah. point. Yeah, right, exactly. But, but this, is, this is the thing, this, this, all these bounces, if you look at the underlying business, no one's buying the stuff because the business is getting it. They're buying it because it's gone from 9,000 to 1,000, to whatever, we, there's a bounce here. And, and the, so these things just become trading vehicles. You've got, yes. you've got all the debt, the sovereign debt of Italy, is now littered across the balance sheets across Europe. The banks here, the banks in France, there's nine billion Italian sovereign debt on French balance sheets, German. Uh, banks are stuffed to the gills with this stuff. It just keeps going around and around and around. Well, France and Spain together have pretty much the same level of bad, bad bank, yeah. non-performing loans as, as Italy. But Italy is you know, it's concentrated, it's larger, uh, and there's, 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 there's no economic growth. So that really ties the current banks into the political crisis, right? Yes, of course. Because the Italian government owns, owes the world about 2.4 trillion. Yeah. The banks owe, have, have lent about a similar, a similar amount, and at least 10, probably more like 12, 30% of it is bad. That means they need the EU to continue to support them. So that makes things a bit more difficult. But one thing that I keep coming back to is, why isn't the Italian economy growing? Look around, right? Yeah. It's the fifth most visited country in the world for a reason, right? It's beautiful, it's, it's fecund, it exports things all around the world. They make things that people want, unlike Greece. Yeah. I mean, they make furniture, they make clothes, they make, um, you know, they design beautiful buildings, you know, cars. they make, make I mean, good cars, yeah. right? So what the hell is going on? Why aren't they growing? And yes, we consistently the message from Italian, Italian politics is we've got to blame Brussels. And I say, yeah, okay. I see that and I, I have a lot of sympathy for it. But look at the situation in Italy that stops the economy growing. What is it? It's not the people, it's not the, it's not the geography, it's not the, it's not the talent. What is stopping this place growing is this suffocating bureaucracy. And have a look at yourself, right? You know, as one, uh, as, as one Italian says to, to another in uh, one of Shakespeare's plays, it is not the fault, dear Brutus, lies not in our stars, but in ourselves, yeah, yeah. that we are underlings. This country is 75th in the World League of ease of starting a business. Right. It's below the Democratic Republic of Congo. <laughs> That's not Brussels. That's, no, that's Italy. That's true. It ranks 111th in getting credit. Well, partly thanks to these guys well, having no more which money. Which is remarkable, right? Exactly. It ranks, ranks 112th in paying taxes. 112th. It's a G7 country. Yeah. It ranks 112th. Yeah, it's behind another 111 countries. There's only 175 in the entire <laughs> right. index. Right. It's not just about Brussels. It's about this system that you've created that suffocates entrepreneurial flair and deters people from coming here and starting businesses and growing businesses. And this guy, these guys are a classic example of that because you've got to have a functioning banking system. So for a window of about four years, you know, these guys, Boba Monti as they're known, Father Monti, anyone could just rock up with a stupid right. business plan and, and walk Get away money. with a check, right? Particularly if they were local. And then all of a sudden that doesn't work out. And now you can't have a penny even if you've got a great business plan. Yeah. It's a terrible way of running things. And then probably most depressing of all, it continues to rank really badly on this global perception of corruption. Yeah. About 54th, I think. Right. Just behind Namibia. Right. One ahead of Saudi Arabia. G7 country. So in, so in terms of coming out of this, I mean, the one thing you can rely on is that at some point, credit will be extended willy-nilly again. We have to get through the phase where they shut the doors and go, right, we can't extend credit to anybody. So if there is some hope, it's that 
we'll all get crazy again at, at, at some point when they all clear a sound. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's fine, right? I mean, to a certain extent, that will alleviate some of the symptoms. But the underlying cause remains that in a country that ought to be one of the most prosperous in Europe, a system that, that, that is weighing this place down and stopping it growing continues to be in place and is hardly being cha uh, challenged. I mean, Macron, to a degree, in, in France, is talking about some of these issues. We need to work harder. We need to remove impediments to incentives. We need to, you know, we need to find a way of, uh, uh, of encouraging growth. That debate's not happening in Italy, right? I mean, the Five Star movement are talking about massive subsidies for everyone, yes. you know? Yes. We've suffered enough. Let's open the spigot. The League, actually, for all of their you know, populism, somewhat crazy, not the nonsense and sometimes racism do have a, a strong platform of, of support for small businesses you know at least fair enough for that but really the debate is all about immigrants it's all about bad brussels you know throwing off the shackles of these people who've oppressed us well you know who's really oppressing you this ridiculously oppressive system of red tape regulation rules inflexible local bureaucrats too much regulation too much corruption Everything's hard. Hard getting a permit, hard getting paying your taxes, hard establishing anything, and so on and so on and so on. And these guys just represent just a, a monumental failure to support business. That's what banks are supposed to do, right? It's to equity and debt. And debt can be syndicated through a bond market or it can come from banks. It's not hard. No, it's not. It's, it's not, not hard. hard. And, and that's the thing that when I look at this, that's the thing that I find so disappointing in the whole thing, because it's the same mistake that gets made over and over and over again. It's, there's you know, nothing new under the sun. It, it, it's, it's a common or garden banking crisis. Yeah. What, I mean, what an awful thing to be in existence. Well, if you really want a lesson on why a stock that is fallen a lot is not cheap, this yeah. is the one. Yeah, exactly right. Right, a stock down 90%. Can still fall another 99% yeah. if it has a bad business. Yeah. Even if it's a big business. The catastrophic destruction of a 500 year old banking institution through misaligned incentives, aided by access to artificially cheap capital, is emblematic of all that ails not just Italy, but the world in 2019. And the interconnectedness of Europe's bank and government debt ties them all together in the worst way imaginable. But it's not all the fault of Brussels bureaucrats. You, when you see Monte de Paschi, it kind of crystallizes what an absurd situation the whole thing is. I mean, this institution's been around for centuries. Six and a half, right? I mean, you'd think they would have managed to have spotted a few uh, pitfalls in the road by, uh, over six, well, and, they probably six did, and a half years. But what they didn't spot was a currency union and, and the pressures that all this massive securitization and, and that chase for profits, that hunger for just turning another dollar instead of being bankers. I mean, it's, 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 it's criminal, Frank. It's a shame. It really is. Well, whether it's criminal or not, I guess, it needs to be made to be seen. But um, it's a testament to how fragile things become when everyone chases the next quarter. Exactly. Exactly. And I think this is something that you and Tony Deedens yeah. covered. Yeah, we did. Uh, in quite a lot of detail, and I think, you know, for a lot of people that was an interesting perspective on things because clearly a lot of investors spend an awful lot of time looking for the next quarterly results. Said early traders live and die by those things, yeah. but ultimately what happens over the next 90 days doesn't really matter. And I think one of the things that history teaches you is that if you want to survive long term you need to be looking further down the road than the next 90 days and you need to be planning for the for, the, for further than the next 90 days and you know there's a lot of criticism of short termism in banking in finance in the way you know companies are run but you know this comes back to the whole nature of capitalism rests on the proposition that people respond to incentives and if you have company executives that are being incentivized, or banking uh, executives that are being incentivized to make money every 90 days or every 180 days, they're going to do that. Of course, yeah, of course. They're going to do that. You know, um, 
there's probably no greater example in American banking history than the transformation of Goldman Sachs from a private partnership right. to a limited company. Yeah, and then onto a listed, you know, listed company, a listed and, then, company. and then to a bank holding company, right? A, a listed, well, uh, uh, yes, but a listed company, and, a, you know, and quite a lot of people are like, when did Goldman Sachs change from this organization of bankers who were looking after an organization that had lasted a long time and planning for the next generation to being one that was just looking forward to the next earnings date. And the answer is the IPO. Right, yeah. Fundamental yep. change in the way the organization ran itself and behaved. And it's just the same here, right? I mean, you've got Italian executives, um, but all you know, people under tremendous short-term pressure to produce constantly good results. And of course, it's nonsense. You know, the businesses, economies, life is cyclical. You're going to have downturns. You can't just turf everyone out because you've just had, you know, a weak quarter. Um, but you know, it's uh, it's the way people respond, and, and to a certain extent, I've got some sympathy for the executives because having run a hedge fund, which I was trying to run for a cycle, because you know we were long volatility, and you don't always get volatility, but right. eventually you do, and you're under tremendous pressure to make money every month. I'm like, it's really hard. To run, a, to run a fund for an economic cycle when investors are tapping you on the shoulder to make money every, every, every 30 days. Well, that's, I mean, that's just gotten worse. And, and this, you know, this, this thing about listing is obviously everyone that is then involved in running a company, sadly, can check and does check their net worth every minute five minutes. Minute, yeah. right? And so you're, you're, you can't help but take your eye off the ball because suddenly you have a bad day. You're not, you can crystallize that, oh my God, this has cost me X today, and, and it and it freaks people out. I mean, it's it, it's it's bad. It's just so, what does that mean? Listing's a bad idea? No, I'm not saying listing's a bad idea, but I, but I think if your if your uh, remuneration is so tightly tied up to the share price, right. I understand. So it's, it's an alignment. Incentive. It's poor it's incentive. It's always an alignment. You said this to me so many times when 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 we work together. It's you have to get the incentives right. If you get the incentives right the results will go the way you want. If you get the alignment, the incentives wrong, you're going to get bad results. I and mean, it's been proven time and time again. What do you think of this idea that you shouldn't get a vote in a company until you've held the shares for a certain period of time? You can't just turn up two minutes before the vote. And... I think it's a great idea, frankly. I really do. I mean, I, I understand that. So if you've got a share, you deserve a vote. But if, if we want to try and, and create stability, and even though there's an illusion right now that we don't need to because everything's fine, we do. I mean, this is a very fragile economic system. That's a great way to go about it. So what, what would the curing period be? 30 days? 90 days? 180 well, days? Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that, for me, I, I would rather it be longer. Um, really? Than shorter, yeah. Uh, I do, because I, I think if you, if you, what you, you really want people voting who have a long-term interest in the company, not who are trying to make a change to, uh, to affect some kind of short-term outcome. That's dangerous to me. Isn't that some, somewhat going to change the way stock markets work? Well, no, but, but how do they work right now? Hunters. How, how, I mean, do they work right now? It, it, I, I would argue that perhaps they don't, because the idea of price discovery and the idea of markets reacting to news the way they've always reacted to news is completely gone. They yeah. just don't do that anymore. Well, I mean, between the, between the, the algos and the computers and the ETFs, you know, right. You've got a big chunk of company ownership being held by computers who don't have a view and ETFs who are essentially passive. Yeah, exactly right. And, and, and you know, for me, seeing, seeing Monty de Passi, seeing this you know, five century old... Six and a half. Six and a half century old institution that has been brought to its knees by this change and this renewed focus on short-term profits, it, it, it speaks so loud to me. It's, it's almost deafening. Before we headed back to Steve's to discuss the investment implications of what we'd seen, we had one more stop to make, the walled town of Cortona, where we would discuss perhaps the thorniest issue facing Italy, immigration. Italians are looking for a European solution, but when it comes to allowing immigrants in, everyone gets very nationalistic. I think your point is exactly right, which is that 
back in the status quo and that Europe always winning and everything holding together has been a reasonably good trade. Yeah. Brexit accepted. I think that level of complacency is very dangerous now.